So let's start the session with you, Joydeep. Now, risk appetites, they get significantly trimmed for investors post-retirement. And at a time when inflation-adjusted returns for fixed income instruments and the likes have failed significantly, how important is equity allocation for retired investors? Because I was just talking to Bhavdi about how the views need to change earlier. It was all static that the closest you are to retirement, everything goes into debt. And then you kind of just keep getting income out of that. But times are changing. So your thoughts on that and how then how can these retirees start treading into that slightly risky zone without venturing beyond their risk tolerance levels? Your thoughts. Thanks, Gautam. And uh, I really like the format that you're following. You're trying to look at the whole life cycle and not trying to overgeneralize into uh, what should be the asset allocation for just about anyone. So it's very interesting. Uh, so when we talk about, about retirement, so first of all, retirement uh, or really generating a corpus which will give enough returns to maintain lifestyle is only possible or near possible if one starts at, at very early in their career. Now, if, if you look at India, people start saving for retirement, any form of retirement, not before age 43. Some studies have shown that. Uh, whereas if you say look, look at Korea, South Korea or uh, certain other economies in the, in the in northern Europe, People start very early. In uh, US, of course, you are you're forced to do it uh, through the 401, 401k. So the whole cycle, the cycle is very important. The, the investment cycle is very important. The, the kind of realization cycle, if it is much, much more than the investment cycle, then there's no way in any economy that you can just live off the uh, returns, be it a returns of a, of a debt fund or of its deposit interest or anything. Because if that was possible, then no enterprise would, would would really put money at risk to get an ROI of 30-40% because if there is a 10% or 15% risk-free uh, return possible, that's just not possible. So let's look at what could, be, yeah, what could be the allocation. Now, going by the psychology of asset allocation, you're, what you said at the beginning is right. People try to become less averse to capital erosion. So it's not just, it's not a question of risk. Risk can be of various kinds, but capital erosion is something that People become less averse to because there's little, very little time to make up. So the, the, the only two ways which I can think of on, philo on philosophy wise, one, if one has, of course, one is, of course, wealthy enough or created enough wealth and not just the savings, wealth as in invested wealth, invest in a start startup and got windfall or a legacy, then one can start picking, making funds to uh, realize uh, returns. Otherwise, people have to look at a, uh, change the philosophy and psychology of leaving behind a legacy for the next generation and look at the mm. corpus and the returns together and try to eat it away in a, let's say, 30 year, uh, assuming one will have a lifespan. Now, that's also very difficult to predict with the current, current medical uh, advancements. Uh, typically, what is foreseen is people in the next generation will live to 120. So maybe, you know, work till uh, finding out work, with, uh, which is like golf, that which you can play till you die is very important. But at the same time, changing philosophy from legacy leaving, except for maybe something want, that you want to leave, but eating away the capital plus interest in a manner that maintains a decent lifestyle, uh, with, mm. which typically 40-50% of the last drawn salary is a thumb rule because the rest is savings. So if one can do that, then the corpus becomes says, zero or near zero at a particular point in time. Health savings is also very different, but that's another, another uh, topic altogether, which we can touch later. What, what about the aspect of, say, financial independence and retire early, right, Joydi? Because we understand that, you know, in the in the past, the paradigm is you work till 60, 65. That gives you enough time to kind of earn and then live off your retirement for, say, the next 20, 25 years. But these are days where, you know, people are talking about financial independence. They want to retire early, live their own lives. How does that aspect kind of change your thinking around this? No, it doesn't because, uh, again, the whole many other things are changing. So for example, asset ownership. Mm. So if uh, if you look at the generation that is coming out of the workforce today, say up to 20, 22 to 26 years of age, and we de deal with a lot of them, the average age of employees in PwC is now less than 26, you know, the 20,000 plus people. So we deal with a lot of them. And the, what we see now is that they're averse to asset ownerships. So it's not that they're thinking mm. of which house to make, which um, holiday home to make, or how many cars they want to buy. They don't want to. People want to invest in, in, in the markets. People want, then they're very savvy. People want to invest in uh, cryptocurrency. They want to invest in startups and they want to have a windfall later on. 
or open a startup of their own and have a windfall and a mixture of all of these two. The second thing is if you do not own assets and you do not grow your liability to be very high, in that mm. case, the, the outlook is very different. One can save enough for, let's say, two years of maintenance and can leave the job and start looking to, to do something new very easily. People are also not going to marry early. That, that, that's another trend. So, so mm. liabilities, responsibilities, which hold us down, which make us feel that we need the income for a long time and save only a sliver of our income at the beginning of the career, that's changing dramatically. And of course, this possible income has also changed. I mean, look at the and you're preemptively because... thinking about liabilities, as you mentioned, the more preemptively you think and, and reduce those liabilities, the more you have the opportunity to make your income work for you. But I wonder if Vishal is going to have a counterpoint considering asset ownership. Of course, when we used to think about invest investment, it always used to be real estate earlier, right? You need to buy a house, probably a second house and you get rental income. So Vishal, let me bring you into this conversation. You know, can you throw some light on what's happening when it comes to investing in real estate as an asset class and how things have changed over the past few years and also the advantages of investing in real estate from, say, a wealth creation perspective? Your thoughts on this and if you could respond to some of the points that Joydeep has mentioned. Absolutely, Gautam. Thank you for bringing me in and uh, hi to all the panelists. Now, uh, Joydeep did speak about uh, capital erosion. And that's the starting point that today at the age of retirement, uh, maybe the growth might be limited, but you don't want your capital to be eroded, right? So that's something which plays on any uh, basically investor's minds. And typically, you know, if you look at real estate, uh, uh, it, it's an appealing asset uh, class for all the investors because one, it's a tangible asset. Uh, it can be controlled with the benefits of uh, diversification. And of course, uh, growth, which is paramount, uh, combined with the diversification and stability. So broadly, investors tend to in look, you know, broadly look at around uh, maybe what, around close to 25% of the investments into real estate. This depends on their in individual's financial goals, uh, long-term plans, liquidity needs, uh, risk-taking appetite, etc. You know. If I deep dive, you know, uh, in some of these reasons why one should look at or why people are looking at uh, real estate investing actively, uh, capital appreciation, no doubt about it, because, uh, you know, uh, it uh, like earlier, like you rightly said, uh, Gautam, that earlier people used to look at residential, right, which nowadays gives you a return only in the range of what, one and a half to two percent. So majority of the people are shifting focus towards other asset classes like an office and maybe a warehousing. Now, let me deep dive further into office and what are the advantages of people, why one should look at maybe investing into office. Like, Firstly, you know, uh, people are witnessing that uh, offices are back. People are coming back to offices. Uh, the trend is that people are or maybe companies are adopting to the hybrid model offices are here to stay. So that fear is gone. Uh, second is it's visible from the traffic on the roads, uh, occupancy in the office buildings has increased. And maybe, you know, just to add some facts, uh, the office leasing was at its peak in 2019. Uh, we saw hmm. absorption levels of close to 48 million square feet, which dipped drastically, you know, in the last one and a half years for reasons uh, known all to uh, all of us uh, for COVID and reasons associated with it. Again, today, it's bouncing back. You know, there is a very strong demand from corporates. Uh, occupancy levels are high. Uh, so that gives a lot of stability and comfort to the investor. An investor education and awareness initiative of Aditya Birla Sun Life Mutual Fund. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.